Hey guys, thanks so much for all those questions. They're great questions. I'll get right through them. Right, so first off we have, are penguins mean? And Coco asks, did any of the birds bite you? So I figured those two kind of go together. Um, no, they're not really mean so much as uh, they're a bit protective of the young. They're a bit protective of themselves. So if they feel scared, if they feel like you're trying to threaten their babies, they, they might take a nip at you. And that is why I've got these. This is why I've got gloves, so they don't take a snap at me. So next up, we have, do mom birds abandon babies or eggs if you touch them? And McKinley asks, which species do that and don't do that? So I don't want to say that myth has no value, because it definitely does, but it is a myth. That's not something that's true. Uh, however, the meaning behind it's still very important. You don't want to be touching birds that you just find lying around. Um, they might not need your help. They probably don't need your help. Uh, and you might accidentally do some harm. Uh, you might accidentally mess with their feathers, mess with their wings. Particularly seabirds, like the ones that we're working with, uh, they have waterproof feathers. And that can get messed up by the oils on your fingers. So it's not true that the moms abandon the babies, but it is true that you probably shouldn't mess with the babies. So if you ever find a baby bird that you think is distressed, I would contact probably an adult person that they can make a good judge on it. Uh, and if it really seems like there's something going on, then contact like the parks department, like park rangers, or law enforcement, like the police. So next we have, how cute were the birds? Incredibly cute. Absurdly cute. It was the cutest thing I've ever seen, seeing a penguin in the wild. It was so exciting. Um, just tiny. They're like this big. They're like really, really small. Um, yeah, they were super cute. The gray-faced petrels, uh, when they're adults, honestly, they're not that cute. They, they kind of look like, a, look like a pigeon with a really weird nose. But the, uh, the chick was really cute. So fluffy. So fluffy. And next we have a question from Ethan. How fluffy and squishy do penguins feel? So this is one that actually has two parts to the answer. Um, a full-grown penguin, they're not squishy. They're not fluffy. Not at all. Um, that's because penguins have to dive into the water and not freeze. So they have waterproof feathers that are really slick. Um, that allows them to glide through the water and helps keep them warm. Uh, if you want to see what that feels like, get a t-shirt, get it kind of wet, stretch it out pretty far, and feel that. That's almost what a penguin will feel like, but instead of it being like little clumps the way a t-shirt will be, it'll be one smooth, uh, smooth feel. If you go to the aquarium, they have the shark touching tank, it almost feels like that shark skin when you're going the correct way. That's almost what it feels like. And the second part to that is when they're babies. So I haven't seen one of my species of penguins as a baby yet, as a chick, uh, but I did get to meet some at zoos and aquariums at other times, and they are super, super fluffy. That's when they have what's called down feathers, which are the really fluffy looking ones. Penguins grow up to full size almost immediately. Like it only takes a couple months for them to get to full size, but then they have those downy feathers that keep them really warm. Uh, over time, they'll shed those feathers and get their waterproof feathers, and that's when they become less fluffy. Uh, but I'm sure I can, I'm gonna post up a little picture of what a baby penguin looks like. Super fluffy super cute. So next we have a question from Will. Are you coming back to SMA anytime soon? And Martina also asks, do you miss first period seventh grade? Very dearly. That class period was all that got me through the day. No, I, I miss you guys very much. It was so fun working with you guys because um, I do still have a family there. I mean, you know my mom is still there. Um, I'll be back to visit from time to time and hopefully be able to pop in, show you guys some penguin stuff, talk to you guys about some birdie stuff in New Zealand and everything. Uh, I really hope I get to come hang out with you guys again. So, what is your favorite bird that you've seen? And Andres, this isn't a question, but he said, tell us if you find a kiwi. Thank you, Andres. Uh, yes. Uh, so, I haven't actually seen a kiwi in the wild yet. I did see one at the zoo um, just a couple days ago. That was super cool. It's like pitch black and dude, there were like 30 people in the room trying to find the kiwi and it was really tough. It took us a long time to find the kiwi. It was super cute. Um, and then in the wild, I've heard a few of them. While we were doing the bird banding the other day, we heard two kiwi. Um, it sounded like breeding season. Um, we could hear them making calls uh, off in the distance, um, probably right around the beginning of Tafer Nui when the forest starts, uh, if you remember the map from the last video. And then the favorite bird I've seen, um, again, favorite one I've heard is the kiwi. That's super cool. Favorite one I've seen, it has to be my penguins. They're very cute. Um, I'll put up a picture of, because I don't have the pictures from the banding trip. We didn't want to bother the the penguin while it was sitting on a nest. So we didn't take too many pictures. We just opened it up and we're like, oh, that's one sitting on an egg. Put that back. Um, yeah, so we don't have pictures from that, but I do have pictures from zoo penguins and ones downloaded from the internet, those sorts of things. What bird species did you band the most? That's a question from Taylor. Uh, we only banded oes or gray-faced petrels on this trip. 
Uh, that was the purpose of the trip, was to work with the Great Face Petrels, and the Penguin was just kind of a happy coincidence. Uh, this next trip that I'm going up on... Oh man, it's already tomorrow. Uh, the trip I'm going on tomorrow is going to be a lot more penguin-based. Unfortunately, we don't have a permit to touch the penguins on that island, so what we're going to be doing instead is setting up camera traps outside of the boxes that are going to flick on any time they see motion, and we'll get a little video of a penguin running into a nest box. Uh, so that one, we're not going to be touching them, but it's going to be a lot more penguin-based, and hopefully I'll have some pretty cool pictures of them for you guys. Uh, what happened to your hair? The kiwis stole it. In the night, kiwis come by and steal all your hair. No, I got a haircut. If oes do not nest in trees, then how do they learn to fly? This is a question from Riley. So the reason a lot of birds live in trees is more about predators than learning to fly. Um, most of the things that hunt birds are going to be on the ground, so if you live in a tree, you're a bit safer. Uh, so that's the main reason. Uh, it also, I imagine, is a little help when you're first getting out of the nest to be able to drop out of the tree and have a little hang time to be able to get your wings out and start to fly. But oes and a lot of other seabirds, like puffins, you've probably seen puffins in pictures living on cliff sides. If you live on the side of a cliff, you kind of get the same impact. You just jump out and you have a good little fall to uh, start to get your wings out and get your bearings start to fly. So the oes live on cliff sides. You couldn't see super well in the pictures, but we were on very steep cliffs. A few of them we had to use ropes to climb up and down. Um, so the birds were able to just, you know, hop out the nest that way. Next, Easton asks, when you track penguins, do you track how far they swim? We do. Um, that's what we have the GPS trackers for. So we can see, are they foraging really far away? Are they foraging close? Do we have one crazy one that's just wandering around? Um, and then we also measure their dive depth. So that's a very important one because it tells us how long they can hold their breath, how much oxygen they have in their blood, how many of different chemicals they have in their blood that allow them to dive. So that's the most important one as far as the physiology, which means describing the inside workings of the birds. And that's one part of our project. Um, so yeah, we do track how far they go as well as how deep they go. And they can go pretty deep. Uh, the last, last year's study found that they dive to about 10 meters or 30 feet on average, but there were some seen going far as 30 meters or about 90 feet. That's much further than I could, you could, pretty much any humans can do without a scuba tank. Yeah. And next we have, what is the job you do called? So I am a PhD candidate, and what that means is I'm kind of a PhD student, but I don't go to class, I don't really have assignments, those sorts of things. So it's kind of different from being a student, and that's why they call it a PhD candidate. It's essentially like I'm working for the university as a researcher. And then um, beyond the job title, what I do is an ecologist, which means I study the environment, the living things in it, and how those two things interact. Next we have a question from Kerrigan. What are the eating habits of the birds? And Jacob Love specifically asked about the OE. So all the birds we're studying are seabirds. They go out into the water to do their foraging, and because of that most of them are looking after small little fish about this size. Uh, sometimes they'll go after shrimp, those sorts of things, pretty much anything that'll fit in their mouth. And with them being pretty small birds, it'll pretty much be limited to like small fish, maybe some crabs, maybe some squid, those sorts of things. And this was actually a, a pretty new discovery, how the penguins do their hunting. So penguins, they can't fly the way the gray faced petrels and diving petrels do. So the petrels, they're just flying along, they see a good little raft of fish, and they dive in, they grab a few, ooh, got a meal. It's a bit tougher on the penguins. Um, so they usually hunt as a pack. So what they'll do is they'll be swimming along, and then they'll see, hey, Looks like some good fish over there. So they go over good to that little bit of fish, and they encircle them, and they're going all the way around, going around, going around, going around, trying to close the fish in closer and closer. And once they have them really tightly packed, then one of the penguins goes shooting through and grabs a couple fish. And then they circle, 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 and then another one goes shooting through, grabs a couple fish. And they keep doing that until everyone's gotten their fill of fish. And it's this really amazing adaptation to them not being very sneaky and not being super fast. It's to work as a team to encircle the prey, and then just go shooting through, uh, so when you have the best chance of hitting them. It's really cool, and that's a very new discovery. From Caleb, hi, are you still happy lumberjack? I'm always a lumberjack, Caleb. The flannel is part of my being, okay? From Jaslyn, what type of penguin was it? So this was a Corora, or little blue penguin. They're super, super cute. They kind of lean forward when they walk, as opposed to Antarctic penguins that stand upright, really tiny. Uh, they're like 30, 35 centimeters tall, which is about a foot. They weigh a kilogram, which is about two pounds. Uh, really tiny, super cute, and hopefully we'll get really cool pictures tomorrow on that next trip. Um, their scientific name is Eudiptila minor, and another really interesting new discovery on them, they used to think they lived in Australia, because there's an island called, um, they essentially call it Penguin Island, uh, there is an official name to it that's not in my mind right now, but um, just, I think it was last year, they split up the species. So I said the Australian ones, because they're darker colored, a bit heavier, and they don't interbreed with the New Zealand ones, they're going to be Eudipta Nova Hollandae, or the New Holland Penguin. And then my penguins, the little blue penguins, are still the Eudiptila minor. 
which means good little diver. You meaning good or true, diptila, diver, and then they're a little penguin, minor. How are you adjusting? Thank you for asking, Jasmine. Uh, I'm adjusting very well. Uh, Kiwis are very, very friendly people. And there's a really large immigrant community here in New Zealand. It's about 40% of Auckland. So they're quite used to people moving in, and uh, they adjust really quickly to you. Uh, they're really open, very nice people. Uh, yeah, I'm really liking it so far. It's Brayden asks, why didn't you show the penguin on camera? Fortunately, we couldn't. Uh, it was nesting, and it was on the side of a cliff. So that has a couple issues right there. When it's nesting, you don't want to disturb it too much. don't want to stress it out. Uh, it might abandon the nest if it thinks that predators are going to get into the nest, and it might see us as predators. So we just kind of slowly opened up the box and said, Ooh, there's a penguin sitting on an egg. Let's close that up. Also, it was on the side of a cliff, and we had to use ropes to, you know, get down to it. So what that meant is we don't really want to be holding onto a bunch of camera equipment. We don't really want to be fiddling around with that, having to hold open the box and take a picture while also grabbing on. Um, it was a safety issue, both for us and the penguin, so we couldn't get many shots. Hopefully I'll get some tomorrow. How long are you going to study the gray face petrel or the OE? Uh, so my PhD is going to be three to four years, so we're going to be studying them the whole time. Uh, hopefully we're going to get three to four breeding seasons of data on them. We're also going to be looking at diving petrels, who are a relative of the gray face petrel, and then the caroras, the little blue penguins. Is it fun? Yeah, it, it's super fun. It is really cool getting to go out there and find out all these things about penguins and petrels that people didn't know before. It's a lot of work because it's it's seriously difficult climbing over these cliffs and particularly when you're catching the birds you're having to scramble up and down the cliffs over and over again for hours it's really really tiring and then you have to go back to the lab and do all the analysis and everything but it is so very worth it getting to help help protect these animals as well as learn more about them get to see them get to go out to these beautiful places and protect these beautiful animals next we have a question from mark what ocean were you at when you saw the penguin so new zealand is between a few different oceans so to the south we have the Southern Ocean, which touches Antarctica. To the east, we have the Pacific Ocean. And to the west, quite a bit to the west, um, there's the Indian Ocean over by Australia. So kind of like the Gulf of Mexico isn't really the Antar er, excuse me, isn't really the Atlantic Ocean. The Haraki Gulf, where we're working, isn't really part of the Pacific, but it's touching it. Just like Gulf of Mexico is touching the Atlantic Ocean. So we're in the Haraki Gulf. What kinds of birds have you seen? Tons. Tons and tons and tons of birds. So, just like in Corpus, loads of seagulls, loads of terns, which are those ones that are kind of like seagulls, but they have a point to your nose. Um, and then I've heard the kiwis and seen them in the zoo, but that, that doesn't super count. Um, but personally, my, some of my favorites that are coming in are the ones that you don't see anywhere outside of New Zealand. And those are called endemic species. They only exist in one place. And the pukeko is the one that really strikes me. Its English name is the Australasian swamp hen, which doesn't make it sound nearly as cool as it is, but it's this flightless bird with this giant nose and these enormous feet. Their feet are like the size of my hands, even though the bird is like the size of a chicken. Like, it's really weird and disproportionate. They run super fast and they make this really strange squawking noise. They're really cool. Um, and it's strange being in a place with so many flightless birds and with just so many birds in general, because they're pretty much the only native species here. It's pretty much just birds here. So you get a lot of really cool ones. But then of course, you know, seeing the gray faced petrels, doing the banding work on the gray faced petrels, and then with the uh, Corroras as well. Um, it's some really cool stuff. How many bird boxes did you deploy? I didn't deploy any. Most of them were already set up. So there were about 40 that have been established for five years now, ever since they started working on these seabird projects at the park. And then they added 20 new ones earlier this year. And that's just at that one site at Toffer Nui. There's also another site at Toffer Nui that I believe has about 10. And then we have three more study sites. So we have Burgess Island up in Mokohanao. And that one I think has 70 bird boxes. And then Otata has 30, and Teri Teri Matangi has about 100. Yeah, so we have quite a few boxes where we're going to get a lot of data, which is the really important thing. If we have four years of that many different boxes, we're getting a ton of data. Um, that's what the research comes from. And last, we have from Shane. Hey, Mr. McIntyre, I thought your video was pretty cool, and thank you. And I like how you and your team are studying and helping the environment. However, once you've banded the birds and go home, what are you going to do to test their behavior? And Shane, I have a very long answer to that, but first, uh, Emma's question right here. Do the birds that you find go back into the nesting box, or do you take them? And so Shane, I think a bit of the confusion on your question might have been based on that. We don't take them home. They don't come back to the lab with us. Uh, if anything, we just take a little blood draw, but we aren't taking them because that's not what our experiment's looking at. So we aren't doing a scientific experiment in the way that generally it's demonstrated in middle school, even in high school, even a little bit in college, where you go into the lab and you change one variable. That's not what we're doing because you can't really do it in ecology. Uh, whenever you're out in the environment, because by taking them into the lab, you've changed so many variables that it's really hard to pick apart which one it is. Um, yeah, so we're doing what's called a natural experiment. 
And so we've picked four different sites that have very different characteristics. So first we have Otata, which is right down by the city. It's pretty populated, tourists go to it sometimes, and so it would be heavily impacted by the city. Next we have Teri Teri Motogi, which is a bit further outside the city, but it also gets a lot of tourists, so they get a lot of interaction with humans. And then further away, we have Tafer Nui, which is where we just went on that trip, and it's a bit more isolated. It's further outside the city, but it's still within range. They get the light and noise and those sorts of things, but you don't have people walking around by them generally. And then we have way off in the middle of nowhere, up in Mocha Hanau, um, at an island called Burgess Island. And that one, the birds are pretty much in their natural state. They have very little interaction with humans. You would expect them to be impacted very little. So that's the variable we're working along, is that gradient of how far away from the city they are, how much interaction they have with humans. And it makes a pretty nice natural experiment, because if we tried to do this in a lab, it would cost so much and probably be super inaccurate, because it's not their natural habitat. So I hope that answers your question. It's a really big question and was a key part to how we designed this research was how do we set up a natural experiment asking as big a question as how does urbanization affect seabirds? That's a really big question. So honestly, your question that you just asked was very central to that. Uh, it's an important one, but it's also a very complex one. So if you're still unclear on that, uh, send along more questions because I know it's a really big one and it's, it's one that we're constantly having to fight how do we make sure that we don't have unforeseen variables impacting it? Because we are going north as we go, so it's also getting warmer. So we might be picking up some impacts that are just from it being warm as opposed to it being urban. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really important question. Thanks for asking. So thank you guys so much for asking all these questions, and hopefully I got good answers for you. I'll take some more great photos tomorrow at Mokihinao, and hopefully get some really cool stuff for you guys. All right, thank you.